Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show where in this video I'm going to tell you about the integrated stress response and a molecule known as ISRIB that inhibits this integrative stress response and how this compound has been shown in a variety of studies to be able to allow mice to form better long-term memories, hence acting as a cognitive enhancer. So in this video, we'll take a look at this data and evaluate this strategy and look at not just what, but how it's actually acting to be able to enhance long-term memory in mice. But before we get onto that, we need to have a good understanding of the integrated stress response, which I promise is a really interesting biochemical signaling pathway. Now, I had an entire lecture about the integrated stress response during my undergrad, and I'm going to try and summarise it in just a few minutes, so brace yourselves. And I have put some links to some pretty good review articles if you're interested in the topic and want to learn a bit more about it, I do recommend you checking it out. But anyway, effectively, the integrated stress response is an evolutionary conserved signaling network that integrates different stresses, hence the name. But joking aside, the importance of the integrated stress response comes down to the fact that for a cell to be functional, it needs to have the right amount, correctly folded, correctly assembled, correctly localised and correctly degraded protein. Protein is essential for a cell to function normally. However, for a variety of different reasons and different stresses, controlling the amount, the folding, the assembly, the localization and degradation of proteins can get perturbed. For example, different stresses include nutrient deprivation, infection by viruses, redox imbalances and defects in proteostasis. So all of these different stresses activate the integrated stress response. And the key output of the stress response is to inhibit general translation and effectively stop any more proteins being synthesised. And so the rationale behind this is to enable the cell to mitigate the stress and restore homeostasis, enabling a cell to go back to normal. For example, in the case where the integrative stress response pathway is activated by depletion of nutrients, for example amino acids, Preventing general translation prevents the levels of the amino acids from lowering even further, which could then cause cellular death. And so this is why it's called the integrated stress response pathway, because irrespective of the type of stress that the cell's experiencing, it all funnels down to the same effect of being able to inhibit general translation, aka inhibit the general production of proteins within a cell. So what is the biochemical underpinning to the integrated stress response pathway? Well, there are four kinases, proteins that add phosphates to different proteins, that can all activate the integrated stress response pathway. The four kinases are GCN2, which is stimulated by nutrient deprivation, heme-regulated inhibitor, HRI, that's activated when levels of heme are low in a cell, PKR, that senses double-stranded RNA, which isn't supposed to be in a cell, and PERC, which is actually stimulated by the unfolded protein response. That's often commonly thought of when talking about the integrated stress response. Um, Effectively, the unfolded protein response comes underneath the umbrella term, which is the integrated stress response pathway. Anyway, all kinases phosphorylate proteins, and one protein that all of these kinases share in common is EIF2, that stands for the Eukaryotic Initiation Factor 2. And it's given that name because it's involved in the initiation of translation when a protein is generated from an mRNA sequence. And how EIF2 is involved in the initiation of translation is due to the fact that it carries the first amino acid of the protein chain. Now, This is where it starts to get a bit challenging to understand, but it's also the most important bit to understand if you want to understand how ISRIB is working. Now I said understand a lot in that sentence, but it's a good word. Anyway, to recap what I've just said, we know that there's this protein called EIF2 that carries the first amino acid for protein production, and this protein can get phosphorylated by these four different kinases. So when it's not phosphorylated, EIF2 carries this first amino acid and also carries a molecule known as GTP. Once it's delivered that first amino acid and adds it to the start of the protein chain, 
that GTP gets converted to GDP. After this happens, EIF2 needs to be recycled so that it can begin this process again. But going back to GDP to GTP requires the help of another protein known as EIF2B. So a simpler way of thinking about it is considering that EIF2 can be found in two different complexes, a before and an after. And EIF2B helps EIF2 go from the after state back to the before state. I hope my diagrams are doing a better explanation than myself. But effectively, this recycling of EIF2 enables the continual production of different proteins. So what happens when EIF2 gets phosphorylated? Well, as I've already explained, when it gets phosphorylated, it results in a general inhibition of translation. And this is because it reduces the amount of EIF2 that's found in the before state. And so how this actually happens is that the recycling mechanism gets perturbed when EIF2 is phosphorylated. To give my kind of nerdy biochemical explanation as to why this happens, the addition of phosphate to EIF2 creates a strong interaction with EIF2B such that EIF2B interacts with EIF2 in the wrong conformation to enable the recycling process. So effectively, it sequesters EIF2B and prevents it from recycling EIF2 back to the before state. So if none of that made sense, the key thing to take away is that phosphorylation by these different kinases that are activated by stress prevents the recycling of EIF2 to the before state that's needed for protein synthesis. So phosphorylation of EIF2, you have a general decrease in protein synthesis. Now, the reason I went into so much detail here is that it now brings us on to ISRIB, the integrated stress response inhibitor that, as suggested by its name, inhibits the integrated stress response pathway. And the way that ISRIB inhibits this pathway is by binding to EIF2B and activating it. And as you can see in this video here, ISRIB is effectively acting as a so-called molecular staple that pins together different subcomplexes of EIF2B, enabling it to act in the recycling process of EIF2 to increase the levels of the before complex. So by inhibiting the integrative stress response pathway, it prevents that decrease in protein synthesis. Now, the two major questions that will come to mind is firstly, why would you want to do this? I just told you that this integrative stress response pathway is an adaptive evolutionary selected pathway that enables cells to deal with different stresses. Why would you want to inhibit it? And secondly, what has ISRIB got to do with memory enhancement? Well, let's address the first question first. Why would you want to inhibit the integrated stress response pathway? Well, being activated by stress, the integrated stress response pathway kind of becomes hyperactive or chronically active during aging and contributes to age-related brain phenotypes. For example, in the post-mortem brains from individuals or animal models of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease and Huntington's show an increase in the levels of the phosphorylated form of EIF2, showing that the integrative stress response pathway is being activated. Now, one explanation for this is due to the fact that loss of proteostasis is one of the hallmarks of aging, and this can activate the integrated stress response pathway. Indeed, neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease are characterised by the presence of protein aggregates. Supporting this link between loss of proteostasis, disease and activation of the integrative stress response pathway now, associated with ageing and these age-related neurodegenerative diseases is the decline in memory and cognitive performance. However, exactly why this happens still isn't completely understood. And so now feels like a good time to introduce you to Peter Walker, a biochemist who did a lot of great work to understand the unfolded protein response pathway, which is one of the components of the integrated stress response pathway, and it was within his lab where they discovered the compound ISRIB. And so Peter Walter had a colleague, Nahum Sonnenberg, and he had data linking EIF2 to memory function in mice. 
And so the two of them together decided to see what effect Isfrib would have on the brains of mice. And what they found was when they injected Isfrib to mice, they were three times faster than normal mice at locating a submerged platform. And so this is just a test that they can do with mice to assess their cognitive ability. And the rationale they had behind this also comes from the fact that memory formation depends on protein synthesis. And this has been shown in studies from invertebrates through to mammals. And so it could be that in ageing and neurodegenerative diseases, where you've got this chronic activation of the integrated stress response pathway, the reason that you see memory decline could be because of the phosphorylation of EIF2 reducing protein synthesis that's essential for memory formation. And so this would be a bit of a paradigm shift in the idea that long-term memory deficits may primarily result as a consequence of the integrative stress response activation rather than the particular proteostasis defects that lead to the induction of the different neurodegenerative diseases. Now, I'm not entirely sure if that made any sense, so let's now take a look at some of the data behind this recent eLife paper, Small Molecule Cognitive Enhancer Reverses Age-Related Memory Decline in Mice. Now, no guess is needed as to what small molecule that's going to be. And so, in comparison to previous work with ISRIB, where they looked at the impact of ISRIB of alleviating symptoms after traumatic brain injury, in this study, they specifically were looking at whether or not ISRIB could be a potential strategy for modifying age-induced neuronal, immune and cognitive dysfunction. And so the way that they did this was they took old mice, so around the age of 19 months, and they gave them ISRIB for three consecutive days as a concentration of 2.5 milligrams per kilogram, and they timed this with the learning phase of a so-called radial arm water maze. And so this is effectively training the mice to escape from a watery maze by finding a hidden platform. And generally, this is harder for older animals to learn. But a week after the older male mice were given Isrib, they were able to accomplish the task as well as the youthful mice, as can be seen in this figure here. And so you can see in this figure that the young mice and the old mice treated with Isrib had less errors when performing the task. And so, so far, the data does seem to suggest that even a brief treatment of ISRIB could rescue the age-induced spatial learning and memory deficits that are commonly seen, suggesting a role of the integrated stress response on long-term memory dysfunction. Corroborating with this, ISRIB also seemed to be able to reduce dendritic spine loss and so dendritic spine loss is commonly characterised in older mice and correlates with diminished cognitive output. And so you can see in this figure here that there does seem to be an increase in the number of spines. And so whilst I'm not going to cover all of the data in this paper, overall there does seem to be some evidence supporting the use of ISRIB in alleviating age-induced memory deficits. And this effect occurred even with brief administration of ISRIB to the mice. So is ISRIB a good drug? Well, obviously this is very early data and it's done in mice, not in humans. And so obviously a lot more work needs to be done, but there are some good characteristics of ISRIB that does make it promising. For example, it can pass the blood brain barrier, which is why we can see the changes in the brain. And it doesn't appear to be toxic to the mice, but we'll come back to that in a little bit. And so clearly Calico think that ISRIB is promising, which is a company founded by Google as they paid to get the license for the molecule. But I want to come back to the question that I asked earlier. The integrated stress response is an adaptive process within our cells to deal with stress. Surely inhibiting it would be bad. And so this is potentially the clever part with ISRIB. As I mentioned earlier, ISRIB binds to and activates EIF2B. But when the integrated stress response pathway is activated, so when EIF2 is phosphorylated, it sequesters EIF2B. So if EIF2 is sequestering EIF2B, it doesn't matter if ISRIB is there, it won't be able to bind EIF2B because it's already being bound by EIF2. So hopefully this is a bit clearer in this graph where you can see that as the EIF2 phosphorylation increases, you see activation of the stress response and the impact of adding ISRIB kind of just delays the onset of the integrated stress response, basically meaning that when there's a strong induction of the integrated stress response, and so when there's a really high level of the phosphorylated form of EIF2, ISRIB doesn't really do anything because it can't, 
because all of the EAF2B has been sequestered. And so potentially the reason why ISRIB isn't toxic is because it selectively targets cells that have this kind of chronic lower level activation of the integrated stress response, as opposed to more healthy cells that have a really strong induction of the stress response. But again, this is still really early data and it's not certain if this would ever transfer to humans. But it's not just neurodegenerative diseases and memory deficits that ISRIB could have potential for. Activation of the integrated stress response is also seen in diabetes and thought to play a key role in metabolic disorders. Moreover, ISRIB could have potential in cancer therapy where cancerous cells increase protein synthesis, which overwhelms proteostasis, activating the integrated stress response. And so ISRIB treatment could be a way of selectively targeting cancer cells. And so even though ISRIB was first identified back in this 2013 study, it does seem like there's quite a way to go before we see human applications of ISRIB, whether it's used to alleviate symptoms of neurodegeneration, metabolic disorders, cancer therapy, or the aging process itself. And another interesting area would be to see how ISRIB combines with the mTOR inhibitor rapamycin, so mTOR is the other major pathway that responds to environmental stresses and can impact protein synthesis. And so with high mTOR activity being shown to actually activate the integrated stress response. So maybe the combination of rapid mycin and ISRIB could be beneficial, but who knows, this is early days and there's a lot of interesting work that we should be seeing in the next few years with these compounds. And so, yeah, um, <laughs> don't think I have much more to say. Well, other than the fact that the integrated stress response is pretty cool, and I barely went into any detail compared to what we already do know about it, but there is so much more we still want to learn about the stress response pathway. Um, it's just very cool. Anyway, I hope you have managed to learn something from this video, and as always, thanks for listening.